Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl Podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. The Tough Girl Podcast is sponsorship and ad-free thanks to the monthly financial support of patrons. To find out more about supporting your favorite podcast and becoming a patron, please check out patreon.com forward slash Podcast. There are currently over 230 patrons supporting the mission to help me increase the amount of female role models in the media. Take action now and become one of them. Today, I'm delighted we're going to be speaking to Aisha McGowan. Her mission is to become the first ever African-American pro-female road racer. She is working tirelessly towards this and is determined to take every opportunity that comes available to make this happen. She's extremely passionate about creating representation in cycling that will encourage and inspire other African-American women to follow their dreams, whatever they may be. My name is Aisha, and I am on a mission to become the first ever African-American female professional bike racer. I am very passionate about encouraging um, and creating more representation for people of color in cycling and the industry and the community all around. And I don't think it's that people aren't riding, that people of color aren't riding. I think that they're just not being represented in content that's being created around it. And if you don't see yourself, it's really hard to... Um, imagine yourself in those spaces. So I'm really, my big mission is to create more representation and, and encourage more representation from the industry. So I'd love to go back to your childhood. Were you were you sporty? Were you outdoors? Were you, did you come from a sporty family? I would say I came from a sporty family. I mean, my grandparents had a lot of land. And so I was outside a lot when I went and hung out with them in the summer times. Like they would farm and they had like wild um, farm animals and so, like, cows and stuff. So I guess that is the most like outdoorsy thing that I really did as a kid, other than just like playing outside with my friends and neighbors. Um, but I, we weren't like going like hiking and camping and whitewater rafting or anything. I did always play sports in some way, not so much cycling. Like I rode a bike around, around town, but my main sports were, track and basketball um, when I was much younger. And then once I got to middle school and high school, I really focused on field hockey. That was my, like my main, main sport. How did the cycling develop or when did you start taking cycling to, to the next level almost? Um, so I went to school for music in Boston. I was at Berkeley College of Music and I started commuting by bike and my local bike shop had a, they had an earn a bike program for the youth in the neighborhood. Um, and it was supported by adult instructors. And so they offered uh, adult instructor training. And in return, the adults, which at the time would have been me, I was around 19 or 20 at the time, we would teach the youth how to build bikes, and then they would get to keep them. And so I participated in that. And that's kind of where I really got into seeing other people in the bike community. Before that, it was just me commuting on my bike by myself. Like I would just ride places and that was sufficient for me. Um, but as I started meeting more people in the community, I got more interested in advocacy and advocacy eventually led to other things. And somehow over the course of about eight to 10 years, I ended up racing. <laughs> so it was a slower progression into um, competitive cycling. But um, I feel like I've participated in a lot of different ways people can enjoy bikes and so I'm really appreciative of that. From what you said it sounds as though it was you know you started commuting as well on your bike. How did you find commuting? How did you find riding on the roads? I loved it. I thought it was incredible because before it was I was being trapped in like the the T in Boston so I was in, on like a subway train with a bunch of people. I had to wait outside and Boston gets pretty cold and I would ride through the well, the first year I didn't ride through the winter, but once I discovered how to do that, it was like, hey, I don't have to like just stand here in the cold and wait for the train to maybe show up eventually. <laughs> I'm kind of on my own schedule. I can come and go as I please. It gave me the freedom to go places where the public transportation didn't go because, it, you know, it's very structured. So the line's going to go from here to there. And if you're not trying to go to any of those places in between, then Either you're going to have to walk a bunch or you don't go if you don't have access to other means of, of getting around. So the bike really opened up my access to the city, and I loved that. It allowed me to take on like 
really interesting jobs that I couldn't have done if I, cause I don't, I didn't have a car and I was really young, you know, so, um, it just opened up a lot of opportunities. And I think my favorite thing that I discovered was when this was when Harry Potter was still being released in the movies and they had released a, I don't, I don't remember if it was the last one or the second, I don't know, but they had it showing an IMAX and it was in Natick, Massachusetts. And I lived in Jamaica Plain and I discovered that it was just close enough that I could bike there <laughs> and I biked all the way to Natick. And that was so empowering for me. I'd never done anything like that before. And it was really, really cool. So I just appreciated how bikes could open up access to, to, to other things. I just, it felt like such a, a freeing tool for me. I think you first got into road racing and entering competitions. Is that right? Not quite. I actually started doing unsanctioned stuff. So I think my first foray into anything competitive was were alley cats. Um, and then from there, I discovered gold sprints. And then from there, I discovered like the fixie crit scene. And my first race was Red Hook. Um, and I'd done a track clinic before then, but I, you know, it was just a very, like, it was just a learning environment. So I didn't feel like that was really me competing. It was just me learning what competing would be like. But the first time I actually um, competed in like an actual race was the Red Hook Crit in Brooklyn. I think that was in 2014. I just want to take you back one second because you said something. What's Rally Cats? That sounds awesome. Oh, an Alley Cat. Oh, an Alley Cat. Yeah. (laughs) Um, It's basically like they mimic like a messenger's job, let's say. So they'll give you a manifest which is a piece of paper that has different locations on it. And the race is that you have to go to all the places on the manifest and be the first one to do it. And sometimes they'll, they'll jazz it up where, where you have to do different activities at the manifest, um, at the manifest locations. So I remember there was one I did, it was called like, I think it was like happy fun time by the Lockbit posse in New York. And I think one of the challenges was we had to shoot a basketball hoop. Mind you, I played basketball when I was a kid, but I discovered that I wasn't very good at it. And now that I haven't played in years, I'm even worse. And it was just so hard for me to make a shot. But it was it's just stuff like that. It feels kind of like an adult scavenger hunt via bicycle. Um, But it was really fun. I really enjoyed it. (laughs) Oh, my God. It sounds amazing. And then obviously you continued on through gold sprints and then your first real race, the Red Hook in 2014. Tell us what that was like. Terrifying. (laughs) Um, It was a, it wasn't a, it was, it wasn't a good time for me. It was like a weird uh, type two type of fun after the fact, but it was actually a horrible experience. It was freezing cold. It was raining. um, And I was really excited about it leading up to, I was really, really into the idea of doing it and participating. It was the first time that they'd ever had a dedicated women's field and I really wanted to support it. And mind you, I'm a generally athletic person. I felt like I could probably do pretty well in the competition, but I just froze. Like I was not, (laughs) I was not ready um, mentally, like maybe physically I could have done something, but my, my, my brain game was off that day. And as soon as they, you know, blew the whistle or fired the starting gun, whatever it was, I was moving, but not very fast. Um, And eventually I was lapped and there was this big accident and someone got really hurt and I just, it ended in tears and I didn't, they stopped the race and I didn't go back out. I just did not have a good time. But from that experience, I decided that cannot be my bike racing experience. I know that I'm capable of having a much better time than I had. I know that I, this is something that I could truly enjoy, but I do need to learn a lot more things. And so I signed up for all the clinics that I could and got better. And and here we are. <laughs> you know, I, th- I think that's actually really comforting for people to know that actually your, your first experience was terrifying it was a horrible experience you got lapped there was an accident you, you didn't really feel ready mentally and, and you froze because you decided to carry on you decided to keep on learning and to go on to the clinics why didn't you quit at that point what made you carry on I'm really stubborn um and I think I just had this vision of what things were gonna go like for me and they didn't go that way. And I was not satisfied with that. So I needed, I needed another chance. I needed a do over. I often say I'll try anything twice, which is mostly true. <laughs> no, but I think that's really powerful, actually, ha- giving yourself an, another chance to do it. Going through that whole learning experience of, you know, going into these clinics, what did you find the most sort of useful? Or was this like, a, a, like 
there probably wasn't a moment, but maybe there was like a moment where things just clicked into place for you. Um, did that happen in one go or was it just more like a gradual progression? Um, I'm still learning. So I feel like every time you race, you either do something right and you decide I'm going to do that again, or you do something wrong and you decide I'm not going to do that again. Um, but no matter what, you always learn something. And I think that that's just how, how it's gone for me, where I just keep racing and I keep learning and it gets, doesn't necessarily get easier. I just get better at it. So there you go. And when you've been in, been racing, have you found that there's many other women there or many other women of color out there racing as well? Uh, there, I, there, there's struggles in both departments. It depends on where you are regionally, honestly, like different parts of the country have a much stronger women scene, um, in the States than other places. But as far as women of color, there's not really anywhere that I have been personally, that's got a super strong scene. I think, um, in the Maryland area, I've heard that they've got quite a few women of color that race over there and then maybe some in Florida, but there are like dedicated programs that are run by women of color that encourage that, which is really cool. But as a whole, there isn't as much representation as I think that there should be. Um, and especially on the pro level, there's just not a whole lot going on there. There's a handful, but not nearly enough. Um, but yeah, but the women scene in it itself struggles. Um, and so that's already a challenge. So there you go. <laughs> I think it's just a really fascinating journey of where you've come from in, say, from your first race in 2014 to to where you are now in in 2019 with with this with this big goal, which is absolutely fantastic. Could you talk to us more about that journey and, and that transition and and how you've got to to where you are now? I mean, the decision to decide to go pro was pretty impulsive and happened pretty quickly. I started racing in April of 2014, and by January of 2015, I decided that I was going to try and go pro, which probably was pretty unrealistic, to be honest with you, but for me, it didn't seem so. Um, And I think what I've learned along the way is that if this is something that you want, it's something that you really genuinely have to commit to, and I feel like every... Every year that I'm on this journey, I kind of dig deeper and dive deeper into committing myself even more to this cause and this goal. And it, it's, you know, changing and, and altering and growing um, where I feel like this past season, my like advocacy part of the mission of creating more representation took more of a front seat than the racing itself. But I was still racing and still learning. And so it's been it's been a journey. Um, but when I didn't see a whole lot of representation for women of color in, in the racing scene, I, I didn't like that. And so I decided, well, there have been a couple of black folks that have done it, black women that have done it, um, and women of color in general, but there's not been any African-American women that have gone pro in road racing. And so I decided that that's not okay. And I want to go for it and maybe I'll be the first and that'd be really cool. Absolutely. I'd be Friggin' amazing. Yeah. Tell us more about your, your advocacy and what you're doing. So there are many parts, <laughs> I guess. I feel like um, I'm constantly doing things, and sometimes I wonder um, how I can do more while also doing less. Um, <laughs> um, but mostly I focus on content creation. So last year, one of my bigger initiatives was um, going around and leading workshops and clinics and, and doing keynotes about creating more representation in content creation, meaning um, people who are creating videos and taking pictures and doing advertisements and even podcasts, just showing more stories and telling more stories about women of color and cycling because they're here, they're around, they're doing stuff, but those aren't the stories that are being told. You constantly hear about white folks or middle-aged white men who are riding bikes and we've heard that story a billion times in a bunch of different ways, but there's this whole demographic of people who don't get any limelight, don't get any shine. And they're all out here too. And I think it's really important to spread those stories because the little people of color, (laughs) um, the young people of color that have an opportunity to really go far in the sport um, don't have access because they don't know about it. Their parents don't know about it. And so the more we talk about it, the more we share those stories, the more likely people are to find it at a younger age. I started racing when I was 26. And so 
I'm much closer to, I mean, technically right now I am retirement age for a lot of pro cyclists. A lot of the people my age who are already in pro cycling are retiring. Um, and so it, it would be really cool if we had much younger people who got into the sport and could really grow with the sport and have a, a really cool chance to soar, you know? So that's my goal. How old are you at the moment? Uh, 31. You're 31. Fantastic. 2018 was was an incredible year for, year for you. You know, you became a sponsored athlete. You were on the cover of a national magazine. You completed um, a national championship race. And you also started a podcast. You rode 206 miles in one day. So I'd, I'd love to talk about those, those sort of different aspects. Tell us more about the podcast. So yeah, how did that come about? What, what's the goals? How are you finding it? So when I initially decided I was going to become a professional, I started a blog, A Quick Brown Fox. And it was a way for me to kind of catalog my story and tell that story um, because I thought I think the journey is just as important. I feel like oftentimes when you hear about people who've done really cool things, you hear about it after they've already done it. <laughs> and for me, I'm more inspired by hearing how people got there in the first place. Um, what were the hardships that you had? What were the successes that you had? What were the resources that you found? How did that work out? And so I was telling my story. And once I figured out that I had a space where maybe I could share other people's stories, I was allowing other women of color to tell their stories using my blog. So they would write about either um, something that happened in their bike life. They did a bike tour or something that they did, anything. Um, and I would share that on my blog. And so now I've shifted it a little bit where um, I have a podcast that people, um, well, that women of color are answering this question of how they got into cycling, because how do we get more women into cycling? Just, I don't know, ask them. So I'm asking them and they're telling their stories of how they started riding a bike or how they, that spark moment that like really changed it from like a hobby to a lifestyle because let's be honest, bikes can be all consuming. So um, just kind of talking to women of color and seeing how they got here so maybe other people can use those stories as a launch pad for understanding how to get more women of color into the sport. And so there's the podcast, which is Quick Brown Foxes. And then the second part of that is that I do a follow-up interview and I put that on my blog, which is aquickbrownfox.com and they answer a couple of questions that maybe we didn't get to during the podcast. And so that's <laughs> that's that project. That's the Quick Brown Foxes project. I'm really excited about it. I've had a lot of fun doing it so far. Oh, absolutely fantastic. And um, just, does it come out in it on a consistent basis? Is it every month, every week? How often? Um... Um, so usually there's a podcast every other week and then an interview every other week. But we've taken a little bit of a break for the holiday. And I think next week, since there's Do Better Together, we're not going to release any podcasts. So the week after, um, which would be January... 14th, the week of January 14th, we'll be back. And it usually is released on Wednesdays. I try my best to get them out on Wednesdays. Fantastic. Absolutely love it. It's brilliant. I'll make sure I include all the links to your podcast so that people can find the links and go and take a listen. Um, you also tell, tell us about the national, the national championship. How did that go? <laughs> Not great. I crashed out. Um, no. <laughs> and I <laughs> slid on a, slid on some, some paint, some, some on a crosswalk and, uh, railed my chin against a barrier and that was the end of that race for me um luckily I didn't get super injured um I could have gotten really really hurt and so it's really cool that I didn't <laughs> I'm pretty glad about that but it was supposed to be a two race weekend for me I was supposed to race the crit and then race the road race and um I crashed during the crit it was wet and it was and I slid out and crashed and so I decided that since I'd hit my head in some capacity I would take a break and not do the road race so I could, you know, stay in one piece and have a, a good race season this year <laughs> instead of trying to overdo it and maybe further injuring myself. And so when you crash, does it knock your knock your confidence or how easy do you find it to get back on the bike again? I mean, I was lucky in that it wasn't something that permanently took me out for an indefinite amount of time. I think I was only off the bike for a couple of days. I didn't feel confident you know, racing again right away, but I could ride. And I think for me, the sooner I get back on the bike, the better it is. The, the longer you wait, the harder it is for you to kind of get over that. Um, I don't think I've so far, knock on wood, <laughs> I'm just gonna, <laughs> um, had anything that took me out for so long, but I, you know, had to just kind of sit in the sidelines and, and think about it over and over again. Um, but I've, crashed a couple of times and it's always a little hard getting back in there, but not impossible. And I think 
the first cut is always going to be the deepest. The, 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 you're, you know, t- terrified of the idea of crashing. And then once you do it and it's not so bad, then you're like, okay, I can, I can do this. I can get back up again and it, and it's okay. But again, I've just been really fortunate in that I haven't had any horrific accidents. Do you work with a, a coach? Do you have a coach to help you with, with your training? So I've had a couple of different coaches over the years. I'm now working with Jim Lehman at Carmichael Training Systems. And this has been a very fruitful relationship for me. I feel like I'm finally getting to a place where I'm super confident in my training. And I think that's really going to translate really well into my racing. So I just started working with him in June, which was toward the end of this race season for me because the nationals were in June and I crashed and I didn't really race after that too much. Um, But I feel like we've done a lot of really good work since since then I've been training pretty hard and I think um training really smart more importantly not just like <laughs> burning myself out so I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing how I race this year I think it's going to be really good could you give an example of um of what your training looks like is it mainly on the bike is it in the gym is it um is it outside is it on the what bike you know how, how do you balance out a week so for me most of my training is on the bike I do a little bit of like strength training, just using my own body weight, some yoga, like calisthenics type stuff. But most of my coaching is bike focused. And most of the fall, it was just a lot of long endurance riding, base miles. And now it's more intervals and like focusing on seeing how I can increase my threshold, which is that point where your body starts to deteriorate more quickly because you're tired and fatigued. So just trying to pretty much increase my endurance and make it so that I can last longer and feel stronger and be more confident. Um, So I'm there at the end to do whatever I need to do. Love it. And tell us about, um, now, is it the Dirty Kanza 200? Yes. So the Dirty Kanza 200 is a gravel race that starts and finishes in Emporia, Kansas. And I'd never done anything like it in my life before. And I haven't done anything like it in my life since, but it's a 206 mile gravel race. It's probably one of the most challenging races anywhere. (laughs) And I did it. (laughs) I didn't go fast, but I finished. Um, and I was really proud of myself and I'm still really proud of myself. Um, for riding 206 miles on gravel in one day. <laughs> so mentally during a race, you know, what, what's going through your head? For me, I think around mile 60, I got really bored <laughs> and I had a lot of like, why am I doing this moment? Um, but also at the same time, again, I'm really stubborn. And so I'd gone in knowing it was going to be really hard. It was going to it was going to be really long and that if I was going to finish, it was going to have to be because there was no other option. Like I made an agreement that unless I was terribly injured, I was going to keep going unless I couldn't, you know? So I took a couple naps on the side of the, on the side of the road there. I took breaks when I needed to. Uh, I went fast when I could. I went slow when I couldn't go fast. I did what I had to do. I didn't, I don't think I walked up any hills. I did drop a chain and so I had to get off my bike once on a hill. But other than that, I think I rode everything, all the downhills and all the uphills and all the all the flats. So yeah, we just took our time and, and got there eventually. It took me all day and it was dark when I finished, but I did it. <laughs> but you did it. Let's talk about your bum because you know the amount of riding that you're doing, the amount of training that you're doing, do you have any sort of um, any sort of issues with like you know saddle soreness at all? A couple years ago, I really had a hard time with that. Uh, it was a combination of not having the right kind of chamois or the right fitting saddle, and it took me a really long time um, to figure it out. Uh, but uh, I got my sit bones measured, and I found a saddle that fit my butt perfectly. <laughs> And that solved so many of my problems. Um, with a race like the Dirty Kanza, I made a – my husband was my pit crew, my husband and my dog. And so before the race, their instructions were that no matter what, at every stop, make me reapply sunscreen, reapply – there's um, a product called AMP. It used to be Topical Edge. At the time, it was Topical Edge. So reapply that and then make me re-up on chamois cream because – 
If not, I'm going to hate myself the next day. <laughs> uh, and it worked out really well. I raced the following weekend, so I was okay. And I don't think I got any saddle sores from from Kanza. But yeah, chamois saddle size and chamois cream is an amazing recipe. Not everybody is the same, but that's what worked for me. I think it's like one of the questions I feel I need to ask every female cyclist, like, what are your top tips? Do you ever get a sore bum? Yeah, it happens. I mean, now that I'm like back on the trainer, when I first start riding on the trainer, I don't usually use chamois cream when I, when I ride. And I did some long trainer rides and I immediately got saddle sores and I was so mad at myself. So now I have to remember to use chamois cream when I'm, you know, doing longer rides on the trainer because it's just friction. You know, you're not, you're not moving as much. There's not as much flex. And so it's you got to pay more attention <laughs> to what's going on down there. Becoming a sponsored athlete is absolutely incredible. And it's a huge achievement. You know, some massive, massive congratulations. I'd love to hear more or I'd love for you to share more about how that how that came about. I can't even imagine how difficult it must have been even to speak. To, to speak to the right people or to you know to get a company involved could you talk us through through that journey of from when you were saying out loud out loud that you wanted to become a pro cyclist and you wanted to be a sponsored athlete and then how you made it happen so I was pretty fortunate the first race I did was the Red Hook Crit again and when I decided I was going to do it I saw somebody who's looking for people to provide for them. Um, So Randy Locklear, who at the time ran a company called HatchMap, um, which was a software company that was making the um, race app for Red Hook Crit at the time, all very confusing, but they were a major sponsor for the women's field of Red Hook Crit. And he wanted to have athletes that were wearing his company's kit in that race. And so I responded and I still have the email and we laugh about it. It's like, I'm really awesome and I'll work really hard and I promise that I'll do my best and all of that. And he was like, sure, of course, and gave me an opportunity and he gave me a kit and paid for my race fee. And um, that was the start of that relationship. And so from there, when I decided I wanted to go pro, I reached out to Randy again, and he was so generous in that he helped me launch that first season and helped me write emails to Cannondale at the time and whoever else, and we tried to scrounge together some sponsorships so I could do this thing because it's just really hard because I wanted to go and race some of these bigger races, and that gets really expensive and really pricey really fast. Um, And so it was really, it was much easier for me because I had a human who was there who would vouch for me and put support into me already and was like, Hey, I'm supporting her. I think it would be really cool if you supported her too. And so that was kind of where I got my start sponsorship wise. I know I applied for a couple of like ambassadorships and other things prior to that. And I never got any responses. Like I'd done like video applications and emails and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and nothing. And it was disheartening, but I never stopped. <laughs> um, and so I think it's kind of like the same as any job. You know, it, it's a tough market out there. But if you keep trying, hopefully, eventually, you'll get a hit somewhere. And you have to be willing to start small. Like where I am now and where I started is not the same place. Um, and so, yeah. So I didn't start as a sponsored athlete. I started as an ambassador, which is usually a little easier to kind of wiggle your way into. With being a sponsored athlete, does that mean financially that you you get enough income coming in so that all you can do is focus on training? Or are you are you working part time or do you have any other sort of jobs or forms of income coming in to support you? So I think with cycling, the term enough is always, always subjective. And especially with women cycling, there's just not a whole lot of money that goes around in that industry, unfortunately. So I do get financial support, but it's one of those things where it's enough if I frame my season so that it's enough. So I can, I try and do what I can with the resources that I have. As far as work, I also, you know, with my advocacy, I've been trying to do more stuff there. I have done some speaking appearances, which I usually get paid a bit for. And I sell t-shirts on my website. I have a Patreon. It's kind of like, I do all of this stuff and I have a lot of really amazing um, supporters and followers that sort of contribute in different ways. I try my best to avoid the idea of donations. I always like the idea that somebody gets something for their money. I don't 
want people to just give me things. I like to work for things. So that's why being like an ambassador or a sponsored athlete works for me because I'm providing a service and it's mutual, mutually beneficial. And then they provide um, either equipment or money or whatever. And that works much better for me than the idea of somebody just throwing money at me and hoping for, you know, hoping for a return. But being a sponsored athlete and an ambassador is actually quite a bit of work. Content takes time. Content takes energy being available for people to, to ask questions and be a resource. And like fortunate for me, it's something that I enjoy. It's something that I've already done. And I've always aspired to have t- types of jobs that if I had to, I would do for free, you know, but it's things cost money. And so it's nice to have the support and a couple of resources to help aid in this journey. Absolutely. How are you finding Patreon? How's that working for you? I'm really shy about it, so it could be working a lot better if I told people it existed. Um, <laughs> but it's cool; like it covers the costs of me running the podcast, and so that's really awesome. So I appreciate that. Patreon is how I make my it's how I make my income, and it's it's one of those really difficult things to be almost like you feel as though you're constantly asking people for stuff, and it and it can be hard to put it out there. But I've randomly like every woman I've spoken to in the past sort of couple of days um, has had a Patreon account, so I feel as though things that things are changing. Um, I've just completely lost my train of thought there, but I'm going to count. <laughs> um, what bike do you ride? Do you have a specific bike that you like riding? Nowadays, I'm riding a Live Cycling Langma. Um, it's their advanced SL0 model, and I'm having a blast. It's really cool. It's my first bike with an integrated seat post, and that's it's nice because usually when I, I – I just assemble my bike a lot and put it back together because I travel so much, and usually – I kind of put my saddle on just a little bit crooked, but I've discovered that with this integrated seat post, it's always perfectly straight. (laughs) I know that seems like such a simple, like silly thing, but I am somebody who's super appreciative of simple, silly things. (laughs) So yeah. And I know lots of members of the tribe will want me to ask this question. Has your bike got a name? Not yet. Um, um, It'll come. It'll come. Waiting for inspiration. One day it'll it'll just happen. Yes, it will. When you're riding, have you um, ever felt? Because I, I mean, I know this can happen for, for women. I don't know if it if it's if it's um, even worse for women of color. Color. Have you felt as though you've been excluded or treated differently when you've rocked up to races? Um, I mean, I've had experiences that were not fun and not favorable, but for the most part, I feel like the community is encouraging and inviting. The few instances and the few experiences that I have had have been individuals, usually, and not reflective of everybody. So that's fine. Have you got any advice or, or tips for, for dealing with those situations? Um, I mean, I've got a lot of experience in general with dealing with that. And I mean, as a person of color, I feel like you go through life and have these experiences, whether you're racing bikes or not. And so you sort of have your own coping me- mechanisms and ways of dealing with things. I don't think there's a a generic answer for that because every situation is different. I feel like if a space isn't comfortable for you, go to a different space and find the people who aren't making you uncomfortable because there's usually those people that are there. And if you need time alone, take that time, take that space. I've had to remove myself from situations. And if I need to do that, I do so. But for me, I understand my focus and my purpose and why I'm there and I try and just focus on that. And if somebody decides that they don't like that and they want something else from me, that's their business and their problem. What can other women do to help increase diversity in cycling in in this sport? Create better spaces. Be more encouraging. I think a lot of the times when I did stuff in cycling in general, it's because somebody invited me to. I started commuting because my friend suggested I get a bike. Like It's simple interactions. The same way it works with your peers and your friends having those same encouraging interactions with other people and just be encouraging and invite people in. Don't make assumptions about what people can do or what people want to do, what people are willing to do. The only reason I did Dirty Kansas is because somebody asked me if I wanted to do it. Someone suggested I do it. That is not something that I would have ever signed up for on my own. I can 1000% guarantee that to you. I only did it because somebody suggested it to me. That was not an idea that I had on my own. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So don't make assumptions. If you see safe spaces being destroyed, speak up. 
boost signals of people of color or um, organizations that are trying to do this work, that are trying to create these spaces. If you have resources, just like um, I mentioned that Randy was looking for people to ride and he, you know, paid our entry fees and gave us a kit to race in. That's so helpful. Like whatever the barriers are, if you have a way of breaking down those barriers, try and do that. Um, and just, you know, if you don't have the resources, just boost the signal, spread the word, share the stories, tell people about the things. Um, word of mouth and and sharing stories is so helpful, which is why like I'm doing this podcast because I think people have this very narrow idea of what women of color do and what women of color are capable of or what they care about. And when you hear the stories, you're like, oh, okay, cool. I didn't know that. And now you know. And that's really awesome. No, absolutely. Super, super awesome. Great piece of advice. Thank you so much for sharing that. And in terms for you, for 2019, do you have any specific goals, any plans, anything that's on your on your wish list in terms of, you know, what you want to get after and what you want to achieve? Yeah, I'm trying to hit up as many road stage races as I can in the States, the bigger ones. Last year, I didn't, I think I only really got to do Redlands and Tour the Southern Highlands as stage races. I don't think I did any other stage races that I can think of. And so I really want to hit the bigger ones. I want to do Joe Martin. I want to do Colorado. I want to do North Star. Um, just whatever I can get my hands on and start with Valley of the Sun and, and Phoenix, Arizona in February. So I'm just really excited to get out there um, and race as much as possible. I just really love racing my bike and just having a good time. My goal is to throw it all to the wall, stop worrying so much and just race my bike and see what happens. Fantastic. And um, what advice and tips would you have for other women who want to get into cycling? Go for it. <laughs> just, just do it. Make a bike friend. Um, send me an email. I don't know. Just go for it. Figure out what your barriers are and knock them down. Fantastic. And Aisha, where's the best place for people to find out more information about, about you? My website is a quick brown Um, and on social media, I'm on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram and YouTube, um, at a quick brown fox. So, um, that's not true. I'm at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at I suppose, which is A Y E S U P P O S E. <laughs> awesome. Why did you choose the handle? I suppose it's a pun. I like puns. So the first three letters of my name um, is A Y E, and you know, it, I think the Twitter came first. So they're they're just my thoughts. Like I suppose this. It's really silly, and I'm very corny, and that's just who I am, and I love it about myself. <laughs> absolutely fantastic Aisha best of luck with all of your competitions that you've got coming up in 2019 go out there and smash it I know you are doing an incredible job I'll be sharing all of the links to Aisha's website Twitter Instagram Facebook and Patreon accounts so that you can go and the podcast as well so you can go and listen you can go and support thank you Tribe, I hope you enjoyed that episode and it has inspired you to go after your own personal dreams and challenges and goals. More information is available at toughgirlchallenges.com where you can find details of all the other women that I've interviewed. There's over 180 episodes out there. We've been doing the Tough Girl podcast since August 2015, so there is so much content available. Whether you're into cycling, running, swimming, mountaineering, physical challenges, hiking, there will be an episode that you will enjoy. Now, at the very start of the episode, I also talked about Patreon and how the 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 podcast is sponsorship and ad free. So let's hear from one of the patrons about why they decided to support the Tough Girl podcast. Hi, Tribe. My name is Katie Jane Lepinia, and I am an adventurer and freelance web designer. I became a patron of the Tough Girl podcast for two reasons. Firstly, I am just very aware of how hard it is to make a living from the world of adventure, hence the reason I top up my adventure income through web design. And I know just how all-consuming creating this podcast must be for Sarah. It was never going to be a get-rich-fast idea. It stems purely from passion, a passion for adventure, seeing the big wide world, challenging yourself. And, you know, that's a passion that I 110% share with her. So becoming a patron was kind of like me giving her, you know, big thumbs up for spreading the word and spreading the love for getting out there and seeing the world. Now, the second reason, probably the most important reason I became a patron is just because I love the content and I use it to inspire and motivate me when I'm at training or I'm on a big trip. 
I actually generally save up like loads of episodes rather than listening to them weekly. And then when I'm on a long endurance challenge or something and I'm in loads of pain and feeling very sorry for myself, I can put on the podcast and I kind of get swept away into the world of other people's amazing journeys. And before I know it, hours will have gone by and I'm still trudging on. And the best bit about this amazing content is that it's absolutely free. Like, I love the fact it's free and available for everyone, but I also think it's kind of too good to be free. And therefore, kind of me becoming a patron is my way of, of paying for that content because I, I personally believe it's worth something. So keep up the amazing work, Sarah. You're doing a fab job. Oh, I do. You know, I absolutely loved listening to that. It's really, really fantastic um, for other people to share why they've become a patron, because I'm sure you've heard me say it over and over again, what a massive difference having your financial support every single month does make. So if you are interested in supporting the work that I do, then please do consider signing up to become a patron. Visit Patreon, patreon.com forward slash tough girl podcast and sign up from $2 a month, $5 a month, $10 a month. It really does make a massive difference. Have an incredible day wherever you are, whatever you are doing, get out there, have some fun, give it your all. And I'll be back with you next Tuesday at 7am for another awesome episode of the Tough Girl Podcast. Take care, lots of love, and I'll speak to you soon.